All righty, folks. We are going to get started. Here we go. How's everybody doing today? Good. This is the first day, kind of. Kind of first day, maybe second day. I'm not sure. I'm not sure where we're at. All right. You are in, hopefully, the right place. Let's double check. Yep. Now you're in the right place. Hi. I'm Dave Cliff. Uh, I work at PagerDuty, a head of strategy of new use cases here, and uh, we're going to have some fun today. Um, now, I wanted to start by addressing the elephant in the room. Um, yes, this is a hoodie blazer, okay? <laughs> Business in the front, party in the back. No, that's a mullet. Shoot. Yeah, mullet, good mullet etiquette, actually. As a, as a Canadian, I, I should have known that, honestly. I should have known that. This is the, that is Canadian reference number one. There will be many more throughout this talk, so don't worry. They're coming. All right, so very, very excited to have you here. We are going to talk about real-time operations, and you're going to get to know me and, and Shannon, my colleague, um, a whole lot more during this session. But to start, I'd like to know a little bit more about you. So... Do we have any PagerDuty users in the house? Woo! All right, I even got some woos, I like that. Do we have any software developers here? Woo! Yeah, all right. Do we have any software developers who are on call right now? <laughs> oh, you poor folks. Bless you, I see that hand. Bless you, I see that hand. All right. Well, we are going to have some fun. So for those of you who are not on call, I encourage you to please Silence your phones. Now, I haven't silenced mine because I'm going to be demoing and it's going to annoy the heck out of me later. But that's, that's, that is part of the demo. That is part of the purpose of the demo. All right, so let's get into it. We're going to talk about real-time operations today. Everybody excited? I can't hear you. Oh, that was so, I, that was so lame. I'm never going to do that ever again. Okay, all right, let's get... Oh, what? We're having a PowerPoint incident. Oh, no. Oh, no. No, I'm just kidding. That's just a pager duty joke. All right. So today, we are going to talk about, as I mentioned, real-time operations and what that looks like. And I want to specifically zero in on DevSecOps. Because that is one of the areas that we see is just exploding amongst our customer base. It's something that is taking off in the industry. We're really excited to be able to get behind it, to partner with fantastic people like Shannon, um, who are just leading the industry and really wanting to define what best practice looks like for this. So we are going to zero in on that in particular. I want to spend some time on uh, showing you a bit of a demo um, and how you can, you can hopefully leverage PagerDuty to enable that real-time operations, specifically in a security context. And then we'll close out with some Q&A. And again, Canadian joke right there if you didn't get it. All right, Q&A. All right. Now, before we, before we go on, I do want to take you through on a bit of a journey. All right. I want to take you on a bit of a journey with me. And in order to go on this journey, I've got my, my good Canadian friend, Mike Myers. And I've always wanted to do this because, I, because honestly, going back in time and telling stories like that is something that I really, really enjoy. But I need you to do it with me, OK? I need you to do it with me. Will you humor me on this one, please? All right? So on the count of three, I need everyone to give me their best boop, 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 as we go back in time, OK? All right, ready? Here, on the count of three. One, two, three. Here we go. Boop, 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 boop. All right, love it. Thank you. OK, where are we going? Well, we're going to 2013, OK? Five years ago. And if you're not feeling old yet, you will by the end of this. Don't worry. We're going to keep going. 2013. I want to know where you were at in 2013. Where were you at? And specifically, what were you doing? What did you own in 2013? How did you work in 2013? Is it different than how you're working today? Because I can tell you, five years ago, I was at AWS reInvent. I was in your seat at AWS reInvent, my first one, five years ago. And I had just left a company called Microsoft, working on their cloud platform that will not be named. Um, and I had just joined this company called PagerDuty. 
And it was, it, was a, it was a really, really different experience. And it's not just the, you know, traditional enterprise um, to, you know, kind of a small startup uh, experience necessarily. I got into PageDuty and I was immediately given a laptop. And I said, thank you, where is my dev box? And they didn't have one to give me. I was expecting a nice pet that I could put under my desk. And, and load it up in all the ways that I'm used to. That wasn't the reality there. In fact, there were no servers to be had whatsoever. I searched the server room in the, in the office location that we were at, and there were none there. Nothing hosting my Microsoft SharePoint. Nothing hosting my Microsoft Exchange. This was a brave new world. And honestly, it's, it went beyond just the differences between SaaS software, honestly, because it was the company itself that, would, that just moved faster. And it wasn't just developers and operations specifically either. It was actually that all of the other disciplines in the company, the customer support team, the sales team, everybody knew how to execute in real time. So everybody was almost vertically aligned. It, the, the coolest thing about coming to reInvent, honestly, um, as a, as a uh, PagerDuty employee is the fact that as developers, we get to engage with you, fellow developers, who are our customers. And having that vertical alignment around our, uh, around our, our company and engaging customers, not just you know, the sales team and the support team, not just product management engaging with customers, but developers too. So that developers could understand and have empathy for the customer experience when things didn't work the way that it should have. And so that was, that was a really, really cool thing. The other thing that I, that I saw pretty, pretty, pretty quickly there is this whole idea of real-time work versus queued work. So I, I certainly still you know, worked with the, the dev teams that I was working with. I was a, a, a PM, basically, um, working with those teams. So I was defining kind of what does the backlog look like? How are we going to um, affect positive customer outcomes? And what do we need to define in order to make that happen? And so I was working specifically with, with them and defining a bunch of things, throwing it in a ticketing system, in a backlog, so that we could go work on those things. But fundamentally, the real-time work around not just operationally what we were doing, but how we could be reactive to our customers in real time was something that I saw immediately. It was so, so different. And that was a really, really cool part of just our operational model at the time. All right, so we're going to go back in time yet again, another eight years back in time. You ready? On the count of three, do it with me. One, two, three. Okay, considerably less participation that time. <laughs> considerably less, I noticed. All right, so we are back in 2005 now. And there was this brilliant person who interview, had an interview with ACM and said these just phenomenal things that I think are really just incredible and, and, and formative for how the industry has evolved. Giving developers operational responsibilities has greatly enhanced the quality of services both from a customer and technology point of view. Somebody said this back in 2005. And in fact, if you are a DevOps advocate, if you will, if you follow DevOps culture, this to me is DevOps. It's not automation, it's not deployment, it's operational responsibilities. It's taking ownership. This is about ownership. And why, why, what's the value in taking ownership? Well, he's, they, it says it right in the quote. It has greatly enhanced the quality of the services, not just from a customer's point of view, but from a technology point of view as well. Let's keep going. The next part of the quote. This brings developers into contact with the day-to-day -day operation of their software, brings them into day-to-day -day contact with the customer. This customer feedback loop is essential for improving the quality of the service. Again, the customer, vertical alignment, and now a focus on feedback loops, taking a signal from a customer and turning it into some action to improve customer outcomes. Who, who is this brilliant person? Anyone have any ideas? Maybe this will clue you in. The next part of the quote. You build it, you run it. How many people have heard that quote before? Yeah, Werner Vogels, back in 2005. 
was when this, this whole philosophy for building software was born. And in fact, I was there. I was an Amazon employee at the time. I came in, I got a laptop, I got a pager. That was the reality at Amazon in 2005. All right, now we're gonna skip ahead forward in time this time. All right, last time, I, I promise this is the last time. Please, please be with me here. Ready? One, two, three. Boo-boo, boo-boo, boo-boo. All right, we're getting, that was a little bit better than the second time. That's kind of what I figured. All right, so now, Seattle 2009, somewhere at Amazon, this is the story of PagerDuty's beginnings. Because our three founders, that is Alex, Andrew, and Baskar, Amazon engineers, left to build a company around this idea of ownership, having developers own it. Getting signals right away from your operational systems, your monitoring systems, and engaging in action. This is where PagerDuty came from. And so this whole mantra that we now push, that you've got, hopefully everybody's got stickers now, everybody got stickers, code it, ship it, own it. The operational model, the, your operational model is defined by ownership. Yeah, sure, it's gonna be proce pro involving process. It's gonna involve a number of different uh, actors or a number of different personas, people across different roles, but fundamentally it's defined by ownership. So if you are a developer and you are, you are writing code, but you do not own the operational parts, you, you don't really own it. You don't really own it. So, this is how we think about taking those signals and actually building now kind of an ecosystem around that. We PagerDuty takes in from over 300 integrations, and again, our partner, partners like AWS, we're an AWS gold sponsor, or gold, uh, gold member for the AWS marketplace. You can buy directly through there. Um, it is a huge part of our product to be able to harness digital signals, not just from IT monitoring tools, but really across the spectrum, but also to engage human response, because it's really not just about getting the signals in, it's actually about taking action. And so we talk a lot about signal to action, making sure that you can engage somebody, engage the right person in this case, and actually get them, get them the right information, the right context to make them successful and understand triaging the issue, maybe if it needs to be kicked off for later, it's not something that's urgent that they, can take, that they need to take care of right now, but it's something that they can go put on a backlog for later. And, and being able to actually collect up this data, we're starting to see signals from our customers that are integrated across, really across the spectrum, not just IT ops monitoring tools. We're looking at, uh, we see CRM systems, we see MarTech systems, we see industrial IoT systems that are now pushing signals into PagerDuty to engage real-time response across a number of different personas that really, to be co completely honest, we're, we're not used to dealing with but it's been a fascinating experience because our customers are taking us there and we continue to learn from them, which is uh, just an amazing part of, uh, of, of growing with this company in particular. Now, I wanna switch gears a little bit. We're gonna talk about, um, about digital operations because I think this, this whole trend in the industry is, is very much growing and the, the analysts are figuring it out, which is great. And Charlie Betts is just one, one of the best um, in, in my view, somebody that I've engaged with many times. And he says that digital operations, they're becoming life-changing and disruptive. They're taking us beyond dysfunctional ways of behaving. And to be honest, the default way that most of you probably get work done with other teams today is via a ticket. You file a ticket against someone, you throw it over the wall, and you hope that they have the context necessary in order to get to it. You don't exactly know when they're gonna get to it. Um, and in some cases, it's actually pretty urgent stuff, or it's stuff that should be taken care of very quickly. And so this whole idea of digital operations is really in line to a large extent with this idea of digital transformation, where now you're building applications, you as the developer are building applications for the benefit of growing your business in a different way than maybe you've ever grown it before. You are building the revenue generating function for your business, and so as a result, digital operations are becoming even more critical. So a, a, new way of a new way of operating, a new operational model needs to fit for this. 
So digital operations we think about in terms of uh, a kind of a more modern approach being that you focus on, you, you support the real time in a more effective way. Real time versus queued. Queued work does not go away by any means. Because honestly, operating in constantly in real time is not a good place. That usually results in panic and chaos. But you want to be able to balance the real time work with the queued work. All right. Then definitely highly collaborative. One of the thing, first things I noticed, again, at adjoining PagerDuty, we were all on chat together. We were all on chat together, cross-functionally, across the entire team, the entire organization, really. And that was huge, just from, again, driving collaboration forward and, and the ability to collaborate in real time. It's much more automated, not, a lot, not as much manual process, um, very proactive, so it's something that once you start to take in signals, like again, from your MarTech stack, you see things that, you know, your, your demand gen spikes for a particular piece of content. Wouldn't it be great to know, know about that in real time and actually be able to act on it, rather than waiting a week? And these sorts of signals, you want, this is how you get to preventative. This is how you get to understand the, the things that you need that close the feedback loop on those things in order to, make, in order to, um, to be more proactive instead of just responsive. And then finally, learning. So what if I told you that digital operations requires more than just developers and operations? That it's actually, even though you, the way that you are working is changing, that it's actually the, the, across your organization, everybody's world is changing. It's improving, it's getting better, it's hopefully becoming less, less cued, more collaborative, um, and people are actually working together in, in such a better way. And with this, I'd love to introduce Shannon Leitz, who is, uh, let's, let's just say she owns the at DevSecOps Twitter handle, so that's gotta, that's gotta be worth something, right? I would think. Yeah, Thanks very much. We'll see. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Shannon Leitz, and I am one of the founders of DevSecOps. And if you've heard about it, awesome. If you haven't heard about it, I'm still working on it. Um, I have been in the industry for well over 30 years now, and um, I would tell you that uh, a lot of my opportunity has been to really watch as new technology has been coming together and also be pretty disruptive in what I do. Uh, I currently work at Intuit, where I run our red team. Um, I'm also a primary founder of Hacker Girl, which is something being launched in 2019. And uh, we're trying to bring more women to cybersecurity. Um, and so today I wanted to bring you a little bit of information about a use case that uh, we've been working with PagerDuty on for a while, and that's DevSecOps. Let me see if I can run this thing. All right, there we go. So how many people like cyber bureaucracy? Raise your hands. OK, zero. Awesome, me neither. I remember about uh, five, six years ago, I was sitting in a room and um, we were launching a product and bringing it to AWS for the first time. And I remember uh, watching as everybody said that it was ready to go. And um, they said, is anybody really kind of nervous about this thing going? And I raised my hand and said, yeah, I don't feel it's secure enough. And I was the only one in the room. And everybody whipped their heads around. It was about 20 people. It was really uncomfortable. And during that period, I basically said, it's not secure enough in my perspective, and we need to do something about that. And they said, well, great. It needs to launch in two weeks. Oh, OK. Uh, it's got some problems in it that probably are going to take a year. And they said, great, you have two weeks. And I'm like, all right, awesome. And they said, otherwise, we're just going to go around you. We're going to take that block out. And basically, we're going to find out. And we're going to work on that. And you're going to have to secure it anyways. And I said to myself, wow, the world's changing. And at the time, I had um, actually uh, come to Intuit thinking that I was going to make a career change. I'm highly technical. Uh, I run a security engineering function and have for most of my career. I'm also a developer, so I actually like to develop code. Um, on my hobby time, I actually still develop code. And as part of this, I, I thought to myself, well, this is the reason why I did the job change was because I realized that everything was moving and changing and transforming, only it was the very inception of security migrating into DevOps. And so it was a really early time. And so within two weeks, we did a lot of security to that application, and it went live. But it, it was really hard, and what I encountered was moving into a development team and trying to help the makers at that time really embrace security. And they started asking really hard questions like, why do I need to do this? And I'm like, oh, that's a good question. Why do I need to listen to this vulnerability scanner? 
Why do I need to add logs? Why do I need to look at thread intel? Why do I need to look at all this information? And I said, well, because we don't want this anymore. We don't want somebody that's going to sign off on it because they don't actually have any context for what you're making. So your job is actually to understand that stuff. How do I make it easier for you? That was a really revolutionary question was, how do I make this easier for you? And so that started the journey of DevSecOps um, at Intuit. And we realized um, at that time in 2013, when he was talking about when we all started here, um, we kind of saw this whole trend, and we've seen a lot more here, where developers need to know security is um, important for them. And they also know that they don't have enough time to spend on it, which meant that when we started this journey on DevSecOps, where we said we're going to move security into the development teams, and they're going to take ownership for it, and somehow they're going to magically take it on, that we also needed to provide services and capabilities and really surround them with the ability to do that, d this security thing in a better way. What that amounts to is um, transforming your security organization, which meant the security org also needed to take on DevOps. We needed to add the ability to make capabilities for our development partners. And um, we brought in more data. Uh, right now, my organization, my group, takes in about two petabytes a year of data. And we transform it and we do things with it like security science and we also hack. So it's interesting that we took a security team that didn't code in 2013. They now code. It took years and lots of frustration. And if you want to go and find out how frustrating, there's a bang my head on this sign wall um, thing that I have in my office. And I actually do bang my head a lot. And what I would tell you is kind of interesting is that taking this large volume of data and turning out these small nuggets of high fidelity information for a developer to act on is a really large pain in the rear end. And um, it also turns into this thing where we actually have to operate it and we have to figure out what to do with it. And by the way, not only are we doing security now, but we're also doing the development of the applications that help us to find stuff to turn it out to our customers, which are the development friends that I was talking about. And that's an amazing transformation that you go through to really figure out that we're going to actually start to evolve and have adversary understanding in our development teams. How many people know how many adversaries our applications have? Any? So the coolest thing that I've seen in um, some of the products that I've been working with is that we're now seeing more and more adversary intelligence being added to these products. In 2013, I went around and begged companies to add DevSecOps capabilities to their products. And it was pretty pathetic, I have to say. They kind of told me, go away. You're cute, but whatever. Um, and in 2018, there are many companies that now have DevSecOps capabilities. You might be able to find them out there. One of the platforms I've been working with um, for the last six months is PagerDuty, and trying to figure out what it really means to have to embrace doing operational excellence with things like incidents. How many of you have had incident response activities that you've had to do? Anybody? Oh, come on. Security happens every day. Who's responsible for security? It's everybody in this room. We're all responsible whether we created the software, we participate with the software, it's a service provider for us, we're dependent on it. How many people go blindly looking for open source? I'm not going to make you raise your hands. Um, but go looking blindly for open source that they use in their products and features and then find out that it can actually be broken into or it was broken into. It's your responsibility, just like it's my responsibility, to do security in these products. And that starts with taking in a whole lot of data, sifting it, sorting it, finding out what bad guys you have to deal with. I can tell you how many bad guys I deal with every day. I can tell you all the techniques that they leverage. I can tell you which component parts that they actually have to worry about in my company. And that's so super important. But by the way, that data comes in a stream every day in these alert things. And it's amazing to mine that data as well. When you get alarms and alerts, they're not just things that, oh, that's nothing. This is nothing to, that's a false positive. How many get false positives? You're all going to raise your hands. 
I know it. Um, vulnerability scanners love to have false positives, but if you don't have false positives, the security people don't think they're very helpful because it's basically got a false negative. We've all heard of false negatives, right? So this is an interesting part of this, this process. If you think about all of this data that's going to come out, who's going to develop an insight? Is it the security team? Well, sometimes they develop insights, but they need feedback loops. And if you're a developer, you want to give all the data to these security people on purpose. And the reason why is because they're going to do something with it. That's their new job. Their new job is to transform the data that you give them into pearls of wisdom so that as a technician, you can do something with it. Wouldn't it be great to know the top 10 adversaries that your application has, exactly how a bad guy is going to do something to it, and be able to defend your application without having to wake up at night for an incident? Nirvana, right? Kind of awesome. It can be done. And the truth is, is that the job of making sure that that's happening is resiliency engineering. People have heard of SREs. How many SREs in the room? I heard a whole bunch of developers and whatnot earlier. SREs are important functionality. If you're an SRE, thank you, because you're creating more resilient applications. If you are a DevOps in this room, be a DevSecOps, because that means that you need to understand what are the security services that you need access to. And you should be asking the same thing I did in 2013. Where's the DevSecOps feature in your product, Mr. Product Provider? Because if you don't ask, there's only one of me and a lot of product providers. And yeah, eventually I'll be annoying enough that they'll add it. Or you can tell them, I really need this security feature. You should be asking them for things like, in this data set, you're going to hear about a whole bunch of noise. Why can't you find a provider that will actually take away that noise? Your logging capability, right? They should be able to pick out all of the bad guys and give you a nice interface. So some of this is kind of transformed because um, we started this thing called DevSecOps. And at the time, security, about six years ago, uh, was kind of on its own island. How many people like to talk to the security crowd at that time? Anybody? Come on. There were a few people who were out there that were interested. How many people like to talk to their security groups now? Are they getting better? Slowly? I'm trying. Um, and just like a lot of my peers and partners that are out there, this is what you're really looking for. You're looking for a holistic approach. You're trying to find capabilities in your security partners that are going to make it so that you understand, so you get the context to what Dave was saying earlier. It's now your job, but if you can't take in that ticket, that alarm, and do something with it, then it's kind of meaningless. So how do I get started? If we think about the definition of DevSecOps, right? And you got to get started somewhere. This isn't just the security team's goals. In 2013, when I talked about it, it was. And now I will tell you I was wrong. I'm always wrong. Um, it takes a while for me to be wrong, but mostly it's after a lot of self-reflection and a little bit of drinking that I find out that I was wrong. Um, and at the time, what I figured was, well, if we can get a lot of DevOps to kind of do a little bit of security, then we can get the security group to add a little bit of DevOps, and this will get better. And so I said, all right, security folks, you got to code. Go. Python, Ruby, whatever you can handle. Um, and I said, by the way, it's not that hard. Of course, I was a developer first in my career, so it wasn't hard for me. And by the way, it was actually pretty hard for them. Um, for security operations, we had a lot of folks that were trying to figure out how they were going to now deal with security operations in a cloudy environment, and that was also pretty difficult. And then compliance operations. Anybody even heard of compliance operations? Yeah, okay, cool. The AWS folks do it pretty well. They have this AWS engineering capability where you have closed loop controls, which are pretty awesome. Um, and then science. How many people have ever heard of security science? It's not data science. It's a lot faster than data science. It actually happens rapidly. You're bringing in two petabytes of data, and by the way, that's probably like 7 to 15 terabytes a day, and you're making use of it. You're finding a very small amount of bad guys in a very large amount of data. And what we see with platforms that are actually doing alarming Think about it this way. Your context and your partner's context are going to be in a platform somewhere where you need to create some sort of correlation. But doing that's pretty hard. You saw that last picture with correlation in it around data. 
and two petabytes a year is a lot of data. So this science thing became really important. And like I said, I thought that this was really the security person's journey. And I was wrong because it's actually everybody's journey. You can't just do security as code in the security group and get it right. You actually need developers and DevOps and operations teams to do security as code because policies right now are really built into your AWS platform. And when you, when you go through all of this process, you figure out very quickly that everybody has to participate, but there's a percentage because if we're all makers in here, our job is revenue and value. And if our job is revenue and value, we actually have to go through the experiments and figure out what exactly is gonna work for the people that we have in the room. I like to think of it like, have you ever heard of um, Edwards Deming? Edwards Deming is the guy who did the Toyota supply chain. And um, how he thought about this process was that you actually got really good component parts. So you focused pretty heavily on the parts that you brought into something. And then along the supply chain, putting things together a routine and ordinary way. So you didn't have a lot of uh, surprises in that process. And in the very end, what you did is you took all this telemetry data and you sifted it and brought it back as a feedback loop to everything else. For software development, we do the same thing. And by the way, if you're running a CI CD pipeline now, a development pipeline, you have a whole bunch of data at your disposal. You have information that can be really helpful for your operations teams, for your security teams. Wouldn't it be great to see whether or not you've got bad component parts earlier in your process because finding defects in production with your customers finding them before you do is not a good thing. Um, that first pager duty alarm that wakes you up, that gets you to realize that a customer put in a defect that you actually feel really bad about is a good eye-opener to realize that the more you focus in on design and the more you get um, experiments going during that period, the better things will be. Now, I will tell you that design engineering can be too perfectionist oriented. Along the way, the thing that I learned that was the most interesting was that if I focused all my effort on design, we also lost because it was too little risk for the company. And so you want to get to the point where you have a nice, even balance. And you're still going to need people who are hacking your application at the very end, because that's what red teams really live for. And you want those people. And the reason you want those people is because you want the um, adversaries that are out there to have serious competition, to find the mistakes that are important to be found at the time that they're supposed to be found. And so when you go through this process, that security feedback loop at every moment in this process is really highly valuable. And it can't all be perfect when it comes out. You're going to make mistakes. So I'll leave you with a few things here at the end. Um, you know, when you put together all of the things I've been talking about and you try to figure it out, how many of you would have been able to find these early on in the cycle? Because I can tell you that when I heard this talk by Vera Code in 2014, I believe it was, no, 2015, it always corrects me, see, I'm always wrong. In 2015, um, Vera Code talked about how to actually do full cloud hacking. And they talked about it as a stack. And we know that this doesn't just mean that the stuff you put together gets hacked. It's your service provider. It's all the component parts. It's everything that you have to think about. And I thought they did an amazing job when they talked about the full stack hack. If you ever get a chance to really hear them talk about this, um, it's amazing. What we decided to do two years prior was very similar. We did this thing called attack maps. How many people do threat models? I'm so sorry. We decided to do some attack maps, and why we did them was because we, we determined that if we hand a piece of paper, a blank piece of paper to a set of developers, they could actually tell us exactly how to break into their application because they knew all of the corners that they cut, all the risks they took. And they could basically tell us exactly where to go. And it was something similar to this. Why was that important? Well, at the time, we realized that if we listened to them and we started to look for what bad guys did on that right-hand side here, you'll see that the, this is actually the amount of exposure that you have when you do something wrong, an API key exposure. Within eight hours, a bad guy will pick up an API key that you expose inadvertently in an internet-facing um, GitHub repository or other repository, and they'll actually use it. 
And by the way, there's so many new security features that when we started doing this, you know, in 2013, it was revolutionary. And today it's commoditized, and thank God. If you've ever seen um, Simon Wardley's maps, they're amazing. If you haven't seen them, please go look those up. They are um, life-changing opportunities for you to figure out when you're seeing commoditization happen. And thank God for middle-sized companies right now that are listening to DevSecOps and adding features to their platforms for all of us to be able to share our context because that's what's really important. I really love the fact that this kind of thing can happen. And you can go through all of this telemetry and data, but you can't really share it operationally unless you have streams of data to share. So what we determined was, and it's gonna look very similar to the thing that you saw earlier with Dave, although his is prettier, I always kinda just do things fast. Um, the data here that comes in is all the security data that we need to find bad guys. And so you'll see security researchers, how many people have a disclosure process. If you have an application on the internet, you should have a disclosure process because the best information you can get about your application comes from the researcher community. Red teamers, pen testers, gauntlet, every security testing capability you can get your hands on is gonna give you some level of information. Your day-to-day -day logs are extremely helpful and most of the time I get asked, why do you need it? And I'm like, I will actually figure out exactly why I need it and if I don't need it, I'm gonna tell you to cut it off. But until I get a sample of that data, I'm not gonna be able to know. And sometimes when you throw away those opportunities, you can't get them back. Correlation, case management. Correlation and case management are crucial elements to the platform that you're gonna buy or build because if you're gonna bring in this much information, you gotta be able to add context to it. You gotta be able to figure out, am I going to spend any time with this data? And the more time you spend with bad data, the adversaries win. So you wanna to get to quickly sifting it. And ultimately, how many security um, bugs go into your developer backlogs? Anybody have that happen? If you don't, you should. And the reason why is because the developers are the key customer for security data. And they know where they have to make fixes and changes and they know whether or not they've got an application that at its core is designed well enough to withstand the problem that you might encounter. And by the way, I used to think that they sent the security stuff to me and I would decide. And by the way, that was kind of a fool's errand because then I actually went and spent so much time with the developers to figure out that I didn't really have, know, understand, or believe that I could actually make something more secure because the thing that they developed had a lot of context and a lot of moving parts. And now I realize that the person who's in the best seat to make these decisions is a developer who's making the software, is a DevOps who's actually making and running the software. And so bringing all that information to them and making it available on a routine basis and sometimes at the very time it's needed, which is at an incident. So I'm gonna tell you, it was a long journey. Um, is there a playbook? It's massive. Um, there are definitely pages and pages and pages of data that go along with putting together an operating model. If you wanna figure out how to form your teams properly, it's hard, um, but it's not impossible. And putting together an organization where your security team can transform is absolutely necessary and possible. And by the way, you're gonna to have to measure, and most of the security measurements that are out there, I've kind of figured out this whole thing, which is nothing's perfect. You're going to make mistakes. The question is, is the mistakes that you're going to allow to be made catastrophic? So figure out what the catastrophic mistakes are and work your way back, and everything else is less of a priority. So we went through this process. This playbook was put together early in 2012. And um, along the way, we've matured it, and we've gone through this maturity exercise. If you look at my stuff, you'll see a maturity model, which is actually a behavioral maturity model. I don't believe there's one right way to do DevSecOps. In fact, I would just tell you there's behaviors that tell me that you're doing it right or you're doing it wrong, and there's behaviors that tell me that you're maturing it or you're not maturing it. And it's super easy to tell because you'll be sitting in the middle of it, watching people around you, and knowing that basically you're either seeing chaos or you're seeing some myriad of security coming into the development process. 
So I'm going to leave you finally with my last slide, which is um, how should a developer and a security professional work together? How should a DevOps and that security professional work together? And it's really simple. There's a whole lot of data and anomalies that are actually going to get sent to your security team. And they're going to transform it into either an incident that they trigger or they're going to trigger a security insight for you. And those few things that they're going to put together in this cycle, this virtuous cycle, is really important. And I don't think a lot of companies yet have really embraced this understanding, but it's super important because you're going to find out that bad guys win until we actually get to the point where we can share data. And it's a really simple thing. You're not competing with your security groups anymore. You're competing with the adversaries. We win when security can be talking to your developers, when DevOps happens. And I know that's a big transformation and a hard ask of the community, but it's absolutely an imperative one. So we entered this conversation today on this slide um, from PagerDuty, traditional versus modern. And what I'll tell you is, it's the most amazing thing to encounter a company that's really gotten to a point where they're collaborating well on development and operations and security. And the reason why is because bad guys have a harder time breaking into those applications. And you get to see more customers love your products because of it. So I'm going to welcome Dave back up so he can go through all of the points here. All right. Thank you so much. Can I, can I get a round of applause for Shannon? Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Great stuff. So one of the points that we did want to make and that, that uh, Shannon called out as well is just this idea of changing operational models really means, uh, can, can be done over time, but, but a big part of the focus is actually when you adopt you know, when you're rolling out new, new cloud services, maybe when you're rolling out AWS adoption from the beginning, um, that you can actually start to, to change your opera operational model, that you can change the way that you collaborate, the ownership model can change at this time. It's a, actually a great time to broach those conversations because, because everything, at, at the application itself is changing anyway. And so the way that you support it, the way that you own it can change as well. Now, disclaimer, this, this is absolutely, you know, trade-offs across the board, all the way down. Um, there are absolutely are trade-offs. Getting to that DevSecOps nirvana, um, you know, Shannon's you know, way, way over here in, in terms of their journey, and you may be, you know, over here or over here or, you know, off the stage. Who knows? Honestly, the, the key is that you actually ap approach the, the cultural aspects in the, in the right way. And the reality of what we found in talking to customers is that this transformation of getting developers to care about security, getting them to engage in the security conversation, can be difficult. I want to introduce you to my friend David. He is a software developer. Um, this is not actually a picture of David. This is a stock photo of a software developer at work. Um, but David is absolutely a real developer that I've worked with. And this whole conversation, as we transitioned operational models, as David embrace this I build it, I run it mentality, there were a lot of things that were coming onto his plate, right? It wasn't just, and, and I, love, I love the phrase that Shannon uses, the, the makers, because as you as software developers, again, in the, in the, as we were talking about digital transformation before, the, a huge part of the, the change is actually understanding that this is what is going to drive your business forward. So you are responsible for revenue generating function, you're building features, you're handling incidents, you're making sure that on-call load is not completely overwhelming, you're working on plan work, you're imp making operability improvements, introducing automation, writing tests, all of these things. So why not just throw some security stuff on top, right? Just fix you know, some vulnerabilities and understand what adversaries are doing and all of, right? Easy. Well, no. That's not what we're saying. In fact, that's explicitly what Shannon is, what Shannon's shied away from, because the the reality is that we you need to be able to connect in your security team and your developers together, and it has to be has to come from both sides. And so I love this. I love how James Wickett from Signal Sciences summarizes this. Um, these kind of four tenets really to DevSecOps culture: mutual understanding, shared language, shared views, and collaborative tooling. 
And the, the thing that this really pulls out for me is this fact that, is the fact that your security team needs to meet you where you're at. But a lot of it, I mean, the, the remarkable thing is that we talk to a lot of security teams, and you know, Shannon, Shannon can attest to this, that are so siloed. They have their own language. They have their own priority system. Does anybody know what a P1S is? I don't know what a P1S is. I can't translate that. Do I need to work on a P1S right now? I don't know. Honestly, different language cannot even communicate. And so what you need to establish is common ground. So you've got to establish that common ground, and you do that by establishing shared language, by making sure that everybody is looking and has visibility into the same set of data. And a big part of that is exactly what Shannon pointed out about sharing data, making sure that the security team has access to the, what, the develop, what you as a developer are doing in the application that you're building. Because that context is super relevant, honestly. And collaborative tooling. So this is, this is really where, how PagerDuty, how we feel like we can help to drive this movement, how we can help to contribute to this movement of DevSecOps, because this is something that we, we do internally. We're you know, maybe here on our journey. We're continuing to try to mature. We're working through the maturity model stages that Shannon has laid out um, for DevSecOps specifically. And we think that we can, we can provide a lot of help here around establishing common ground. What are, what are common terms? What's a common kind of visibility? What's a common response process that you can use? and at least align those things. Because in a lot of cases, we, we talk to customers and they're like, yeah, yeah, we want to run like tabletop exercises, you know, um, in case we have, you know, a data breach, we want to make sure that we understand what we're doing. Well, how is it that that process is like completely decoupled from your operational incident response process? That makes no sense to me whatsoever. Because it's fundamentally a real-time process. It involves different people, different actors maybe, but fundamentally you've got to get people together. And so building common ground is a huge place for starting and being successful with incident response. Then you need to be able to drive security hygiene forward. And the way that we do that is we partner with a bunch of great, great vendors, security vendors, who are basically baking their, their process into your CI CD pipeline. So we can take those signals and we can enable human response. We can enable real time action to be taken on those signals. So we've been working with Dome 9, uh, ThreatStack, TwistLock, Sumo Logic, a number of security partners across the board to make sure that those integrations are there and that you can start to use them and leverage them. So if you do have any others that, that uh, that we don't have, please always let us know because we are eager to work with partners to make your, your life much better. And then handing off to ITSM and chat. So this is a, a big part of, again, real-time operations is understanding what is a signal that needs to be taken, taken advantage of right now, what can wait till later, and the ability to actually have that create, create a ticket in a backlog for later once you realize it's not something that's urgent right now is something that, that we can provide in and, and that delineation between real-time and queued work. And ultimately, this is all for sharing, sharing security accountability. Because we want to be able to give you the right context to make it so that developers can engage in the security conversation. Fundamentally, the platform on the bottom, that's where your security team needs to get in there, especially. They need to make it, your security team needs to come to you with the right set of tools to meet you where you're at to make sure that, that the, the right guardrails are in place, the right tools are integrated, the right metrics are coming out. And fundamentally, when you need that security expertise, when you can't handle an alert from guard duty, as an example, that you can escalate very, very easily to somebody who, who knows how to help you and who you can collaborate with. OK, with that, I do want to switch over really quick. To, uh, to a demo here. So I want to show off a little bit of what, what we've been working on and how we can help in a security context. So I'm pulling, pulling up PagerDuty here. I'm going to take a peek at some of the incidents here. I can actually uh, set myself to on call. I'm going to go pop into a schedule here. I'm going to say, hey, I'm going to take on call from, from Tanu, override. Bam, all right, I'm on call, perfect, let's go. Okay, 
So I've got some, some open incidents here that I, can, that I can, can deal with. As you can see, there's a number of guard duty findings. So this is a, one of the integrations that, uh, that we've been working with closely, um, working with uh, the, the guard duty team. And there's a number of other uh, open incidents in here. And you can see that, in, that some of these actually have a number of uh, triggered alerts that have actually been grouped into it. And that is one of the, one of the main capabilities that, that we've been working on is the ability to actually start to correlate, group in those alerts together into one package so that you can actually go work on those things collectively. Now, I, going back to accountability and talking about how we get different, different developer or different personas engaged, I want to show you a couple of the different ways that you can do that. So one of the ways is that you can use our global event rules. So I can say, hey, anything that is a cryptocurrency finding from guard duty, I want to route specifically to the security platform team. They're going to take care of that, more, more centralized. And then just like you're, you're probably all used to using already, every service has a specific set of integrations associated with it. And so some of those integrations could be Guard duty for the specific findings for your application, CloudWatch, CloudTrail, all the other ways that you're monitoring. We want you to be able to pull those, pull those all in together. Now again, we continue to expand security integrations to make sure that those signals are coming in. But fundamentally, if you come upon um, an incident and you really, you're really you not sure exactly what to do with it, so maybe let's drill into this particular guard duty, guard duty incident here. One of the things I can do is I can actually go drop down and I can create a JIRA bug. So I want to actually go drop that directly into a backlog. Um, and that will actually go create a, a link JIRA ticket so that, again, I can hand this off. It's not something that I need to take care of right now. The other thing I can do very, very easily is I can engage somebody with security expertise. So I'm going to run a play. I'm going to engage security on call. And that is going to go pull in the security engineer for this incident. So now I've got some immediate help, very incredibly frictionless experience, which is, again, a huge part of this, is that you, you don't want to be left on an island here. You have some of the expertise that you need within your organization. You want to be able to leverage it as quickly as possible and as easily as possible. So another piece. Um, so again, we, uh, we, what we want to get to is really a, a, share, a state of understanding common ground, right? And being, being able to drive our, our hygiene forward. If this is something that we're just going to, say, kick off to, um, to a, a, a ticketing system, maybe we want to we actually assign a priority. These priorities should be consistent across your organization. They shouldn't be security specific. They should be something that, again, you can establish common ground. Maybe a P3 defect is something you pick up in your next sprint. All right? Simple. You can set that right, in, right directly from the mobile app. Now, if this is actually, in fact, a P1 incident, something that we need to mobilize a, a more uh, fully, uh, fully enabled response on, I can actually go and change the priority to, say, P1. And I can go run a play there and actually engage our red alert policy. And this will actually go and start to notify six different teams across our organization, start to mobilize a response, get everybody onto a call bridge, everybody into shared Slack channel in order to actually go work on this collectively. So this incident here, wrong one. So there we go. So this incident is now going off and engaging uh, a, a bunch of additional folks here in order to actually bring this response forward. All right, so we've got a number of different folks from different, uh, different parts of the organization. And one of the other things that in order to establish and kind of maintain common ground that we've introduced is something around what we call visibility. And this is where you actually are connecting up the individual technical services of your application into the, the actual business function or the, the customer function that this enables. So here I've got, as you can clearly see, I've a couple of disrupted business services. I've got a P1 on my shopping cart that I can go drill into. You can see that it's been active for an hour and a half. Customer requests are in the tank, which makes sense. We're in a P1 right now. I can see those updates right there. I can even drill into the underlying technical services in order to see a little bit more about what's going on. 
All right, so a lot, of, uh, a lot of our best practices and one of the things that Shannon touched on that we really want get, to get better at and we want to get out into the community is more around best practices. So has anybody been to response.pagerduty.com before? A few people, great. So this, these are our open source incident response documentation. Uh, we've, we've made them more just a blueprint for you in kind of building your incident response process more than anything. We've also open sourced our, uh, our review process. So we do weekly on-call reviews. We do monthly service performance reviews. We do quarterly business reviews. These align well with our, our, our analytics offering as well. And then the other thing that we've done is we've open sourced our security trainings, both for employees as well as security training for developers. These are all resources that please use them, make open, open pull requests on, please make, help, make, help us make them better because we really want to provide kind of a better community here and continue to build, build that together more than anything. All right, let me jump back and we'll wrap up. So how we work is changing. Hopefully that's obvious. It's not, but it really is not just you in development or operations or security. It really is across your business. And one of the things that I think that we've pulled out, certainly in engaging with the customers that we have, is that it's the same principles, DevOps principles, the comms of DevOps, culture, automation, lean, measurement, sharing. These principles show up across, across your business in, in really, really unique and interesting ways. And that's exactly what we want to lean into. We want to make sure that, that it's super easy to basically build, uh, build your tech stack to support, support that and to make it, help it to grow and help people to collaborate more effectively. So this is, this is where, where we'll close out. Where we started as PagerDuty is really around on-call management. We've got 10,000 customers that we've learned from, and some, are some of the most operationally mature customers across the board. We learn from teams like Shannon's and how we can, um, how we can improve our product, how we can make it, make it more palatable, more useful, and drive better outcomes for you as customers. And so we've now seen it taken into a number of different verticals, a number of different, with a number of different personas that we didn't entirely expect. Seeing it beyond SecOps into customer support teams, into business operations teams, into now industrial teams as well. Some really unique personas. And fundamentally what we've done is kind of distill out that knowledge as much as possible and try to understand what are the products that we need to build out of that to help promote that culture. So with that, I will, leave you, I will leave you here. Cloud adoption, prime time to change your operational model. Security and development, you gotta, gotta come together. It's not, not a, not a one-way street by any means. And fundamentally, where, where we can contribute to the conversation is really around distributing that operational accountability. So thank you very much for, for your time and your attention and your participation more than anything. And I hope you enjoy the, uh, the rest of the conference.